just be able to share your word. And Father, I pray that you guide the words, Father, that said today. Father, that you just open our hearts, Father, that we're open-minded, open-hearted. Father, looking at it with your eyes and be able to see, Father, what you would have us to do. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. I don't know about you, but I know that God didn't give us this nice, comfortable building that we're in just to be nice and comfortable. Do you understand what I'm saying there? There's a reason and purpose that we're here. Uh, and be honest with you, we may not know the full intent of it yet. I don't believe that we will. I believe by the end of this year, we'll be able to look back and see the real intent and purpose for the reason that God put us here. And uh, I was, where, where this material came from, I didn't buy this material. In fact, you can't buy it. It's free. How much stuff do you get free today? Not very much. Salvation was free, but it was at a mighty big cost. It didn't cost you and I anything. All we had to do was accept it and receive it. But uh, I was out here mowing, I think I told you last week when I mowed the, the uh, lawn that we have out front. And a gentleman come by. It wasn't the ordinary way that he went. Uh, in fact, he wasn't out just walking. Uh, the only reason he was walking is because his car was in the shop. And he had to walk home. And he come by, and we got into a conversation. And I knew immediately, and he knew immediately, that it wasn't just a chance, perhaps, meeting on the street. That God had brought us together for a purpose and a reason. And uh, we shared quite a bit. We shared quite a bit in Scripture, thought, belief. And uh, immediately our hearts bonded spiritually. And what he did, he said, I'm going to bring you some material. And what he does, he works for a group called World Missionary Press. You ever heard of those before? Guess where it's at? Paris, Indiana. New Paris. Not old Paris, but New Paris, Indiana. All right? Right in our own backyard. It's been around for quite a while. I think they actually started in 1971. You're going to get to meet this man and his wife here eventually. In fact, uh, I've, I've already uh, told him when he gets the opportunity, uh, they travel. They're traveling constantly. That's the reason he didn't come last week. But I was out here mowing yesterday, and he knew he had to get me this material that he promised me. He didn't have my phone number because we didn't swap phone numbers. And he, he, he started to just wait, and then he said, well, just per chance, I'll go back by. Maybe he'll be down there again. And there I was out there mowing again. Wow. So he gave me the material, we traded some information, and uh, I told him as soon as he got back in town again to let me know, I'm going to have him over for dinner, and I want to have you and Pastor over at the same time, we we'll are sit down and talk together. Uh, you don't buy this material. World Missionary Press, when they started, their intent was to get the word out to as many as possible, and free of charge. Now, they don't... Uh, they don't operate on nothing. Takes money, all right. But they're like the Gideons. They don't give you for money. Uh, Gideons will give you Bibles if you need Bibles. But they're, it's done strictly by a donation basis. In fact, their material, when you uh, apply, you don't order, but you apply for more material, you get the material based upon whether they've got the money to send it out or not. I, don't, I know that you can't see this, but I just wanted to show you that's a lengthy page. There's five columns, and it's from top to bottom. And those are names Katrina. of languages Katrina. that they send out into the world. And believe me, I didn't know there was that many different languages in the world. Probably it's not all of them, but this is how many that they send out into the world. I didn't count these, but I will one day because I was impressed with it. That's the different languages that they send out. Uh, he and his wife travel all over, all over the U.S., and even in down to Guatemala, giving out this material. <clears throat> so he's worked for them for quite a while. It's an interesting deal how he got started with them, and I won't try to, to take any part of his testimony or his wife's, 
but uh, it's very, very interesting. You're going to enjoy it, and if you think I speak fast, you're going to really have to be on your toes with him because you won't get a word in edgewise, I can guarantee you. It takes him an hour just to say hello. Uh, he says a lot, says it quick. But I, I want to, what, what this is for, for those that I got from him, he gave me two boxes of material. And <clears throat> these were in there. There are some more. Uh, this is not the full content that they have. But this box that I have over here <coughs> is chock full. I think there's uh, 500 little booklets in there. And they happen to be the one called... Uh, the way to God. So if you've got that little one, the way to God, you'd be able to see what is in it. This is actually for children. It's scripture, but there's it's printed bigger print, and it's printed in a way that, that children can read it and understand it. And if you'll notice, if you look in any of these, you're going to find that it's not man's opinion. It's, it's basically scripture. Scripture, Scripture, Scripture. <coughs> I went through every one of these books before I even considered bringing them here because I didn't <coughs> ask the pastor about uh, mentioning these. And I thought he was going to be here and I was going to mention it before service. But uh, I can assure you this is all good and solid. This is the same book that we read on a daily basis. Uh, the one that is really good for you and I is The Amazing Life of Jesus. And the reason why is because, well, let me start this another way. <clears throat> I came up here to do some work. How many of you know what this is? A tool bag, right? Now, that's just my tool bag. In fact, it's got all kinds of junk in it, <coughs> including push pins. They come in very handy for a lot of things in your toolbox. All right? Duct tape is another. A duct tape's must for any repairman. I mean, you've seen the shows on duct tape. Duct tape is good. But in that toolbox, I've got a lot of little tools that are necessary for things that I do. Uh, I have one for carpentry, I have one for electricians, for the plumbing in, and usually this is just a general, like a no general medical doctor, I, I can handle a lot of little things with just this little kit. But if I'm going to do strictly electrical, then I go get my electrical toolbox. If I'm going to do plumbing, I have a plumbing toolbox. Why? Because I'm trying to pinpoint a particular need that I'm doing. Now, just as much as that toolbox helps me to do necessary physical material things that I repair, these things here are nothing more than a tool. Now, uh, Howard had asked me quite a while back, how do I take this out there? This is how you do that. This is a tool that you can take with you. You may not be able to memorize a bunch of scriptures. I lost that ability. I still know a lot of scriptures, but I, I, I don't have the ability that I used to have due to an illness that came upon me in 1988, and I lost a bunch of that. But these here, you can take this book, just like this amazing life of Jesus. If you've got a co-worker, friend, relative, or whatever, you could take this book right here, and you wouldn't have to go through every verse. But you've got enough right here in your hands to lead a person to Christ if that was the intent but at least to take them from level one to level two whatever level that they're on let me explain that because maybe some of you don't know what I'm talking about there it's not your intent all the time evangelism is not always to lead somebody to Christ your job as in the area of evangelism and witnessing and discipleship is to take somebody from the level that they're at to their next level. It's actually not even to do that as much as just to present to them what you know. Remember what we've been talking about in this mind deal that we've been talking about, renewing the mind. Taking what you know and applying what you know and letting them know this is all I know. 
but it's enough to get you to heaven. And then, in this little book, it even has in the back, it has a, what will you do with Jesus? Now that you know about him, what will you do with him? And it also has in there a little prayer guide. Everything that you need to either win somebody to Christ or to take them to the next level. And I want to be honest with you folks. We, we spend all the churches, I'm talking about all over the United States, I'm not going to say into the foreign countries, because I'm going to tell you what we're finding more and more and more. I heard this yesterday. I heard this yesterday from, by the way, the couple that I'm talking about is Thomas and Olivia Smith. She's Guatemalan. He is right here in hometown Indiana is where he was, was uh, raised at. But anyhow, regardless of where you're from, this material goes all over. But here we are in America, and for years we've been sending people out to the mission field, praying for the missionaries, praying for those people. Well, it's turned 180 degrees now. They got a phone call yesterday from her brother, who's he's been stabbed, uh, tried to kill him. All this just because they're Christians, not because they're doing anything wrong. And he called her and told her, said, we've really got a burden on our heart. We're praying for America. With all the problems they got, and they're praying for us. Why are all the missionary fields so concerned about America? Because we're at a level. We're at a complacency level. Everything's okay. So what I'm giving you today is a warning. Don't get comfortable with what you've got. That's the very thing Satan wants us to do. Wow, look at our church. Those pews are nice. We have a nice fellowship hall. God didn't put it and give it to us to sit down on our laurels and enjoy. Okay? I know, and that's why I can speak to you this way, because you're the very ones that's given up your Saturday now for 22 weeks to come to a Bible study on a Sunday afternoon when you had other things you could be doing. So I know that you're people that can take this to heart. The rest of the church won't get those things down there. You only get those here. I'm not being crude and rude and cold, but you put out an effort to get here. Not only that, I don't have enough for the rest of the church. <laughs> That's why you're getting them. It's because of that. Now those, we have plenty of. And they're for the children. I'm going to tell you about these. This particular one doesn't have anything on the back, a place to write. The rest of them have a place back here for a church stamp. We don't have the church stamp. So don't dare give one of these away. And I don't want you keeping this stuff. I want you to read it, get familiar with it. But this is to take and, and give to somebody else. This is to help someone else. But when you got one that's got the space on the back that's got a blank space, like, who am I that a king would die in my place? Write the church's name and address on the back of there so they know where this came from. Otherwise, it may help them, but they may go off into some place that's not going to help them. We don't want to just help them with something like this. We don't want to just help them on the street. We want them to know that you can come here and get more of what's in this booklet. You can get some help. All right? Now these down here that's for children, and that's what this is, the way to go, or the way to God, I'm sorry. <laughs> the way to God is the way to go, all right. But this was designed especially for children. Now the reason that I give you one is because every one of us has got children or grandchildren, or know somebody that does. But not only that, some of you may be like me. This has got pictures. <laughs> I can understand this. It's big print. I need that. But it's very simple and very well laid out. And like I say, you may not 100% agree with everything that might be in one of these booklets. Now, I've been through every one of them, so I know what's in there. But the thing about it is, it's the Word of God. And whether we agree with what's said or not, it'll work. God honors His Word. His Word never comes back void if you give it up. Now, I don't want you to just take these home and put them on your shelf. I gave them to you for a reason. 
I intend for them to be given to somebody. Make an effort. We're not in revival, so we're not talking about getting them. Well, we're talking about taking them to a community. Don't, don't take them to somebody else that's, that's already going to church. Take them to somebody that needs it. This one right here, let's praise the Lord. That's for you. That's for you and I. This tells us how we win. Tells us how we're victorious. Tells us where we get our joy back from if we've lost it. So this is for you and I. It's, it's a powerful little book that you can just praise your way to victory, to be honest with you. Now, <clears throat> there's something else that later on I'll, I'll share with you about these. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm convinced in my spirit that I'm going to make an effort to do something with this stuff. We've got, uh, well, there's over 500 that we've, we've got in this box. They're in a little display, and the only reason I put them out is because we want the church to take them. <clears throat> Have you ever been to the rest areas where they've got all the displays of all the free stuff? And what happens? I'll tell you what happens because my wife and I have traveled quite frequently. My wife gets one of every one of them and is stuck in the car. And as soon as we get back home off whatever trip we're on, I've got to take and do something with those things and get rid of them. And it's a waste. But <clears throat> I don't want you to do that with them. What I want you to do is make sure that somebody gets one of these. Those that they take them out there, I know what will happen. They'll, they'll eventually they'll disappear. But that's good. They're going to go somewhere out there. If they lay it down on the table and somebody else gets it, that's fine. we got plenty more. I'll restore that. The reason I don't have that many of these is because it was a it basically a sample box. He also has Bible studies in this. There's some videos that he's getting me so that when we do get our screen up here, uh, we can play those videos and you'll be able to see some things about what they're doing out on the mission field itself and, and uh, about World Missionary Press altogether. But I, I'm just intrigued with it. I mean, it's absolutely, and here's the thing about it. We started out in here with Blood Covenant from the very beginning, from Genesis 1, understanding who we are, how we got to be who we are, and, and what it's all about. And the fact that it was free for you and I, what God has done, all He's done, provided everything necessary for us. We went through a, a study on judging. If you remember that. <coughs> How not to judge and what to judge. We went through a, a study on righteousness so that we knew what we had from Christ. Uh, we went through receiving the Holy Spirit and what tongues would do for us. We went through a study uh, in just recently here <coughs> excuse me, about uh, Acts, our position, uh, not Acts, I'm talking about Ephesians, our position that we have in Christ, and then the battle that we possibly face on a daily basis, <coughs> and what to do about that. So we went through all these things. And like I, uh, I was telling you earlier, I can have all the tools that man could possibly own. And I've got far more than probably what I really need, but I've got them for a reason. I've ran across those jobs that I needed them on. I may never use them again, but if it comes up before I die, I've got them. There's a lot more tools out there that I could get. But here's the thing about it. There's no use. You can, you can come to these studies. You can gain all the knowledge that you want and, and hopefully, hopefully, we've put out something that's been a benefit to you through these studies of 22 weeks. So I, I hope that we've at least got something in the studies. But those studies will do us no good at all unless we take the knowledge that we've gained and apply it. It's the applied knowledge that gives us the victory that we need. It's the applied knowledge that takes it out into the world and shares it. And that's what God is all about. Uh, I love the verse over in Acts where it says, And God added to the church daily. Why did He add to the church daily? Because the church was doing something. God doesn't add to a church daily that's dead or the doorknob. 
He won't do it. There's a lot of churches that have a whole lot to offer as far as programs and uh, comfort and activities and all this stuff, and they get a lot of people in, but it's not necessarily God adding to the church daily. And what we want is God adding to the church daily because we're doing something with what we've got. And I don't want to bore you to death in that area, but this is where we've come down to. This is what it's all about. Is taking what we've got, taking what we know, and applying it out into the world. <clears throat> now I want to share with you a verse of Scripture. I'm going to share with you two or three verses of Scripture. And uh, that was just the introduction there. But uh, in Acts chapter 13 is a favorite verse of mine. I've mentioned it before. And uh, I want to mention it now because it says something about what we're talking about. Remember, I'm still, we're still here in Ephesians. I'm still talking about that battle and in, in things about it, but I want to share this today about this particular verse also. Acts chapter 13, and I'm just going to read verse 2. And it says, <clears throat> Acts 13, 2, As they ministered to the Lord, who, who was ministering? Well, it tells you that in verse 1. I'm not going to read that. You can read that. But it says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said. If you want to hear what the Holy Ghost says, then minister to the Lord and fast. Remember this little book? Let's praise the Lord. That's what that's all about. That's what's ministering to the Lord. When we come to, to church, and many of the church services that we come to, we're not necessarily ministering to the Lord as much as we're ministering to self. Now, I'm speaking of the church worldwide, not necessarily our church. But I'm going to tell you that most of the services, in fact, I'd say the majority of services, even tomorrow, during Easter Sunday, of all things, will be ministering more to self than the Lord. But it says, as they ministered to the Lord, the Holy Ghost said, and I believe said pretty specifically, but he said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. There's a calling on God's servants. And the thing about that, the first phrase is the secret of it all and just speaks volumes about his, how God calls his servants to service. <clears throat> These two men that it mentions in there were already in God's service. They were doing things for God. Just as much as you and I in the, in the service that we're in, everybody in this church has a place of service, something that they can do and does. And I, I, that's what's beautiful about this church as it is because we're united together. Didn't nobody tell anybody that they have to come down and we got a new building now, you got to come down here and you know mow the yard or change the lights or clean this or do this or do that. We did it. The Bible says it speaks of it in great volumes when it says about in the uh, Old Testament of the sanctuary in the wilderness, they had a mind to work. They had a mind to work that, to get things done. All of them. Because they all had the same mind. They were united together. They had a mind to do things. And that's what it's talking about. These two men were already serving the Lord. They were already doing God's will. Readily available. And this is how God exalts His people. This is how God moves His people up to the next level. When they're faithful where they're at. When you're faithful in doing the little things that you do. Whether it's mowing the yard. Whether it's hanging a sign. Whether it's working, you know, the sound. What, whatever it is. Whatever little part that we play. Because it takes every one of us to make it work. All of us to playing the music. Huge part. The singing in the choir. Whatever you do, there's a part to play. It doesn't make any difference if you just walk out here and greet people as they come in the door. That's a big ministry. They know that they're welcome when they come through the door. My greatest ministry I worked at when I was going to school was in the parking lot. Parking people. The reason why? I was the first person they spoke to. When they got out of their car, out in the parking lot, 
you had a place to minister in the parking lot. So there's all kinds of things that we can do, and God exalts his people and moves them up when they're faithful doing what they're supposed to do. All right? They were worshiping here, even fasting, so they were open to the Spirit's leadership. When, when we're doing this right here, this very important little book that let's praise the Lord, when you go through that, you'll find out. It's got some titles in it above these that's a little bit bigger than the print. Like the, on page one, it says, Praise the Lord with exuberant joy. And then it goes through to give you some, some scriptures that you can actually see. The first one says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. A particular individual said that God had put it upon his heart. Well, a uh, particular individual happens to be Watson Goodman, the man that wrote this little thing. You'll notice on the inside of that cover page, he said, let's praise the Lord. God put it up on his heart to praise him 15 minutes a day. Can you imagine? I mean, most people spend 15 minutes a day at their rising moment in the bathroom. We've got 15 minutes a day. We can praise the Lord somewhere. So if we praise the Lord 15 minutes a day, and, and that's what he said God had just put it on his heart and challenged him to ask for a million people in all countries around the world to praise the Lord 15 minutes a day. You'll be surprised. This is not about everybody else. It's about you. What it will do for you just to praise the Lord. And when I'm saying you, I mean me. Because all of us' little joy level sometimes tends to fall down. And if you want to get your joy level back up, praising the Lord's the best way to start. Oh, don't wait till Sunday morning. Yeah, it's easy to praise God in here. It's, it's a little bit more difficult out there. It's a sacrifice of praise when it's done out there sometimes. And here's the principle. Those who've proven themselves faithful in little, little are given stewardship over much. And you might think, well, I, you know, I've been in the church a lot of years and I'm not really over much. Well, you'd be surprised what you're over. I mean, we're to humble ourselves and, and, and follow Jesus' example and just be a servant anyhow. That's what we're called to be. But to be faithful just where we are and what we're doing, it, it's not about how much money you give. The widow gave the little two mites, the only thing that she had. Jesus said she gave it all. She did. She gave all she had. He said hers was much more than the Pharisee that it gave the big bucks. So you see, it's in the little things that we do. It's in our heart. And the lesson to be learned from it is this example is that the, the believer that's desiring to hear the voice of God for service, first off, has to be active in the Lord's service. There's a lot of people, I, when, I, when I was called to the pastorate in Ohio, I, I don't know, I could not name you. All the ministers that come to me want to come preach at the church now that I had a church. One told me, he said, I, I've just got to have a place to preach. I said, what's the matter with the street corner? They don't do that no more? Start where you're at. You know, you don't have to have a building to preach to people. Start with those that you're, you're around all day, your family, your friends, your co-workers. I mean, that's a ministry in itself. You know, some, some people in here work at the nursing home. What better place? They can't get away from you very fast in those wheelchairs. I mean, you can stay up with them preaching to them. You see, there's a whole lot of things that, that we can do. And uh, I, I am just very, very much impressed with a tool to have in my hand. Like I say, don't keep them in. If, if nothing else, you know, if you don't if you don't do anything but just take this. Hey, brother, you ever read this? Listen, they they may take and yeah, they may lay it down, but guess what? Pray over that thing before these have already been prayed over. In fact, they were prayed over right out here in the parking lot. You know what that man was praying for? I'm gonna tell you two things. Number one, what he was praying for was that not only would God bless these, that's God's word, it won't come back void. But he was praying that this church would be full. He's not connected with this church. He has nothing to gain. He's not looking for a place to preach, teach, or do anything else. 
But he said, God, fill their church. You put them here for a purpose. Fill this church. You want to know what else he said? He said, soon as my wife and I get back where we've got a, a day or two, he said, if you'll take these, this way to God, if you'll put the church stamp on there where the people will know what church it came from, we'll go through the community knocking on doors and handing them out to those that are unchurched. Now that's a man that, that's after God's own heart. He didn't say, if you'll pay us, we'll walk out here. He said, we'll do it. They're as old as I am, or older. That's absolutely wonderful. Couldn't turn a guy down like that. No, no, mon no nothing to gain from himself, strictly in the service of the Lord. He's got a wonderful testimony. You're, go you're going to love to hear their testimony. Now, I want to take the remaining time, because I want to share with you something, and this, this may be controversial to your ears, doesn't make any difference. But because this is the time of year, this is Easter time, this is when Jesus arose from the dead, resurrection power <clears throat> is the most important thing that as you and I as a Christian can understand. When Jesus arose from that grave, you and I got another measure given to us that Old Testament saints did not have. Prophet, priest, and king had it, but all the saints didn't have it. And here is what it is. It was the Holy Spirit come down. When I rise from this grave, when I go to the Father with His blood, when your redemption is paid for in total, then I'm going to send, I'm going to pray the Father and send the Holy Spirit back to dwell in you, to seal you, number one. And when we studied the blood covenant, we, we, we touched on this matters about who we are. But we're now, when we accept Christ, we're a born again child of God. We are sealed on the inside with the Holy Spirit. We have somebody in there now to teach us in all truth, to lead us and guide us in all the ways that God would have us to go. We've got something, and it's powerful. It's resurrection power. It'll move mountains if we believe in Him and trust in Him and, and depend upon Him and allow Him to do it. But I want to read to you, uh, oh, that's not my Bible can't speak out of somebody else's Bible. <laughs> well, let me go to uh, John chapter 20. Go with me there because I want you to see something here. This is a familiar, and this, I don't know, whoever's speaking tomorrow may use this same passage of Scripture. If they do, then you got a head start on it because we're going to look at it today. It's normally a, a passage that is used around Easter time. John chapter 20. You're all familiar with it. Rwanda and I has been in about 38 Christmas services in the last 38 years. Uh, not Christmas services. <laughs> Easter. <coughs> at the wrong time of the year. But we've been in a lot of those. Uh, and some sunrise, some not sunrise. But we've been in a lot of services. Heard a lot of messages about it. <clears throat> Over the years, there was a question that came to my mind that comes right out of here. And that's the reason that I want to, to share this passage of Scripture with you. <clears throat> and I'm going to read it in its entirety. Not the whole chapter, just uh, probably down to... <clears throat> well, we'll stop when I stop. But chapter 20 of, of the Gospel of John, first verse says this, The first day of the week come with Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and see if the stone taken away from the sepulcher. So she's coming, it's before daylight, She's coming on a mission because she wants to uh, do something with the body. She wants to anoint the body and uh, prepare him for burial properly. It says in verse 2, then now she, she sees the stone taken away from the sepulcher. And verse 2 says, then she runneth and cometh to Simon. I want you to understand that she didn't look in that tomb. She just came and immediately when she saw the stone rolled away, she left. She went back to where the disciples was. She got a hold of them there. It's come up to Simon Peter and the other disciple, who we know as John, because he's writing this uh, little course here, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They've taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they've laid him. Now she hadn't looked inside. She come up. She seen the stone roll away. It was dark. She couldn't see everything inside the tomb. She immediately assumed they've taken him. 
And she left and went back to the disciples to Peter. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together and the other disciple, <laughs> wouldn't you know that when you're writing about yourself, you kind of build yourself up a little bit? The other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher and he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying yet went he not in. Now, Peter didn't go in. Then cometh, uh, I mean, John didn't go in. He got there first. He stooped down, looked. He seen the linen clothes lying there, but he didn't go in. Then comes along Peter in verse 6. Cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lying. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Let me give you the scenario of that. The, these tombs were cut. This was a rich man's tomb. It was cut in. It was cut with a ledge for the body. It was also cut with another little ledge or two up here for different things, you, like, like something to remember him by in the tomb. And the napkin that covered his face, which is very important, was laid up on one of these ledges by itself, folded up and laying there. The rest of the linen clothes wasn't. All right? It says in the napkin in verse 7 that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, John, <clears throat> which came first, and he saw and believed. Now this is the one that got me right here. For many years, I questioned, what did John see and believe? You see, they didn't believe the resurrection yet. The, the passage makes a statement about that. In fact, verse 9, For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Now, it wasn't that they wasn't told that. It wasn't well, that they wasn't taught that. When it says they didn't know, it means that they didn't perceive it. They didn't have the knowledge in their head. They had let, in fact, you've, many times you set in a service and you know some things just go right across your head, didn't stick inside. Somebody else grabbed it, but you didn't get it. All right? So that's what it's saying here about them. It wasn't that they wasn't taught about the resurrection. It wasn't that they didn't uh, uh, maybe even believe to a certain extent. But it says here, as yet they knew not the scripture. They was not taking that Old Testament scripture. And listen, you could find a ton of it in the Old Testament. But they, they didn't know that scripture pertained. They didn't understand about the resurrection yet. But it says... This other disciple that went in, who was John, in verse 8, which came first, he went inside and now he saw and he believed something. Now he believes. What is it that he believed? If it was the shroud of Turin laying down on the floor neatly folded up, that wouldn't make you believe. I mean, if they stole the body, they would have left, they could have left that there. That's not going to make you believe. Something he saw made him believe beyond a shadow of a doubt and that's why they went back to the others and told them that's why they got excited even after they saw Jesus now they knew he knew something right here something I know he's risen he's not here anymore but what was it go back to chapter 19 well actually if your Bible's like mine it would be right there in front of it but uh, in verse 38 Chapter 19, verse 38. Something John saw caused him to believe and believe beyond a shadow of a doubt. It stirred him. It stirred him tremendously that they could go back now. There was not a problem waiting now. Of course, we know we read on the scripture. We know that Jesus appeared to him <clears throat> more times than once told him to go back, you just stay in Jerusalem until you receive the power that's coming from the Holy Ghost. The fire is going to come up on you. But they've got an excitement in them now. When, when we find them in that upper room that they spent those 10 days or so up there waiting on that Holy Spirit to fall, they was waiting there expectantly now. They knew. They knew that Jesus had arisen and they knew that something was coming. But what was it that he saw? In chapter 19 and verse 38, <clears throat> says, and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, in other words, after Jesus had uh, uh, died on the cross, 
<clears throat> Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. We could go into a study of that. He was very wealthy. Nicodemus also, it mentions in the next verse, there, he was the one that came with Joseph. Joseph and Nicodemus is the one that took the body down. And they, uh, which at first came to Jesus by night, that was Nicodemus, but they brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. And you can do all the research you want and you'll find out that a hundred pound weight of myrrh and aloes was far more than what was needed. It was very, very wealthy. There was possibly as much as a quarter million dollars or more worth of myrrh and aloes involved in all of this. In our day and time, money, not necessarily in theirs, you understand. But they took the body of Jesus. They were wealthy. They could get all the myrrh and aloes they wanted. But it says they took the body of Jesus and wound it <clears throat> in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. And there became, therein posed the little problem. Because when we read in the Gospels, Number one, the Jews, that wasn't their Jesus. If they'd admitted to that he was the Messiah, it would have blown all their religion away. All right? So they're not going to say, the, the one thing that you'll find Orthodox Jews saying, well, no, he, he couldn't have been, uh, this was not the manner of the Jews the way he was buried because he was embalmed with the myrrh and aloes and stuff in the strips. And, and that was done like the Egyptians because the Egyptians slipped the body all over so that the myrrh and aloes would actually go in to the body and mummify it. But he didn't say it was as the manner of the uh, uh, Egyptians to bomb or to bear it. It was the manner of the Jews. And I'm going to tell you what, it took me a long time to find out what the manner of the Jews was in their burial at that time. Why? Because there was no Jews who wanted to admit that. If they'd admitted that, that that was the manner in which he was buried, they would have admitted that this guy did arise from the dead, whoever he was. And that if he arose from the dead, he almost had to be the Messiah, and we're the ones that were involved in getting rid of him. You see that? Myrrh and aloes. Myrrh and aloes is both resins, and they come from a tree. In fact, one of them doesn't even come from that area. It comes from a Yemen. That's why it's so expensive. They used it for a lot of different things. They used it for perfume. They used it for embalming the bodies. And another version of all of this says, well, they just took it and they, they dried it because they did do this. They would mix it together, let it dry, it would harden, and they would crush it and make a powder for perfume in the body. And that's why they bought so much because they wanted to make sure he smelled real good. That wasn't the manner of the Jews to bear they didn't make a powder to sprinkle inside like a napkin or a diaper to make you smell good. Here's the manner that they was, and he tells us here. They took the body of Jesus and wound it in an clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Here was the manner in which they buried. They took every individual finger and wrapped the finger with linen cloth, about one inch wide. It was coated with this resin, myrrh and aloes. Every finger, every hand, every toe, then every hand, every foot, until they had the entire body wrapped and coated with that. All right? When you mix myrrh and aloes up, they've already proved that it hardens. All, all those people that uh, denied Christ proved that it hardened because they allowed it to harden so that they could crush it and make the powder perfume out of it. We know it hardens. Now here's Jesus wrapped in this body. You remember Lazarus? When Jesus brought him from the dead, what did he tell him? To loose him. Why? Because he can't get out of there. He can't untie himself. He's wrapped up in all this mess. In fact, once it hardened, I'll give you a very good indication of it. Have you ever seen anything made out of fiberglass? That, that's resin and cloth. You take the cloth to farm it, 
You put the resin on it, when it's hardened, there you've got it, like a cast. Like a cast on your leg or your arm. What did John see? He saw the cast. The only way he could have got out of the body was through that face hole. And guess what? He even took the little napkin and folded it up and stuck it up on the ledge. That's what set him on fire. That's what set the disciples on fire. That's why they could go back. Nobody stole that body. They couldn't get it out of that thing otherwise. It's a cast there. And it's still there. Except that nobody kept it. <laughs> don't get rid of that thing. We don't want to believe it in that. Do you see that? That's what John saw. John ran into the tomb and when he saw that cast laying there and he saw Jesus ain't in this thing no more and Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had personally put that on, they knew he was on the inside of it and then when it hardened and the only place to get out is through the face hole, it was powerhouse. Now they're not just sitting in a, a, an upper room whining and snotting about no Jesus. No, they're there now. They know Jesus has arisen from the dead. In fact, He's come and He's visited with them. And He says, stay right here. This ain't all yet, folks. You're going to get some more. You're going to get power of the Holy Spirit. The power is going to come on you to go out and witness. And when He came into that room, they were expecting it. They knew Jesus has arisen from the dead. He's with the Father. And we're fixing to get the power from the Father in the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And look at Peter's first sermon when he got up and preached in the anointing of the Holy Spirit and 3,000 people got saved. When you begin to see that, when the resurrection power comes, when you begin to understand this man was dead. He's just as dead as anybody was. And now he's arisen. And that's what makes Easter so beautiful is to know that that Christ that was in the grave, he's not there no more. He's alive. I love that song. I love somebody that can sing that song. He's alive. He's alive. He's not dead. We don't serve a dead God. We've got a risen Savior. And he's in our heart today is what the song says. And we know that. We know what it says here. But I don't know how many of you have run across that before. But listen. I, it, it just bugged me for years in the denominational church I was in. They had no expert. They used the same explanation that most of the Orthodox Jews had. Oh, no, that's it. You, you know, you're just the clothes. The Shroud of Turin can be tore all to pieces with the Word of God. That's the biggest fraud there ever was. I don't mean by some man. I'm talking about the Word of God itself can tear the Shroud of Urine. Turin. Urine. <laughs> the Shroud of Urine. Turin, Turin, crowd of Turin, all to pieces. <laughs> you can do it with God's word. All right. I may not be able to pronounce it, but somebody can. Glory to God. I hope you understood a little something about that. I hope it shakes you. I hope it makes you want to go look something up and try to, to disprove it myself. Because I'll tell you what, the more you dig, the more you'll find out how real it really is. And you'll get on fire because of it. It will set you ablaze realizing that that's how they put Jesus in the grave. He was in there. The only thing Mary was going for, listen, was to perfume it. Uh, not very long. It may have been in the same day because each of the Gospels puts a little more twist on it. I don't know if John even says that, but let me look right quick. <clears throat> All right. she, he appeared to Mary, of course, first when she went back to the tomb. After the disciples left, they didn't stay around there. Mary was there. She thought he was the gardener, so immediately she saw it. Now she goes, you know, of course she shares it, but then uh, he appeared to them. Yes, I would say it was probably almost immediately after that. <coughs> Beautiful. Because they're blinded. This is what will open their eyes. You got it in your hands. You give somebody that word, it can open their eyes. The only thing that can open anybody's eyes is the word of God. 
And you know what? You don't have to be a scholar to present this stuff. Like I say, all you got to do is, uh, look at this. The most important thing that I found about witnessing over the years is this. How do I shift the conversation from talking about the weather out here over into a spiritual conversation so that I can understand where the person is coming from? When we were out on the street out here and I was talking to Thomas, <coughs> we were talking about the weather. Common ground. The way that I shifted the conversation was, I said, yes, the Bible says that in the end time, we won't know one season from another. You see how easy that is? It's shifting the conversation. When you go into a person's home, what you want to do, is you want to find a common ground in that house that you can talk to that person on. If they've got artwork hanging all over the place, that's where you start at. Absolutely, believe me. Those people know how to, to get to it. They're, all of their, their teaching has got holes all in it. But they know how to get in. They know how to shift the conversation. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and we as Christians sometimes miss that. It's just real easy. The immediate thing we want to do is shift that conversation to Scripture. You won't have to worry. They'll follow you along. They'll let you know whether they are or whether they're not. And then you know how to approach it. If they're a Christian already, you can say, well, praise God. You know what? We're on common ground. <clears throat> if they're not, you can say, you know what? I, I like this little booklet, and I want to share it with you. I want to give you something that you can, can keep and read. It says, who am I that a king would die in my place? I don't know any kings in this world that would die in my place. But there was one that did. Would you like to read about it? There you go. You see, it's just it's a matter of just shifting it from the devil's turf to your turf. Turning it around. Letting them believe. We've got everything that we need to go out and do what God wants us to do. And now I just put an extra tool in your hand to stick in your toolbox. So take it and share it. But as you do, if you give it out, remember, if it's got a place on the back, Right gateway on it. Now, if it's somebody you know, they're going to know where it comes from and may even ask you. But if it's somebody that doesn't know, put gateway on there and put the address. What is the address of this place? 609. 609. Uh, South 609 South Lincoln. Why? Why do you do that? Because they know where to come and they just may stop by and visit you. <clears throat> Praise God. I love you. I hope you got something out of this. I'll give you a little early because we've got choir practice here. So. <laughs>